Welcome to St John's and to St Saviour's and to our online worship today. My name is Rick, I'm the vicar of Chapel Town and I also help the leaders up at St Saviour's in High Green. Uh, I'm going to be leading the worship uh, and doing that alongside uh, Jim, one of our curates, uh, a number of folks from High Green and from Chapel Town, and also quite a team of our musicians. And we really hope you'll enjoy your time with us today. Uh, I know that we're being watched by those beyond Chapel Town and High Green, so can I say wherever you are, whoever you are, you are extremely welcome and we really hope you'll not only enjoy today, but come again. We love to see you. Well, before we do anything else today, we're going to greet each other in the Lord's name. The words will appear on the screen that we're going to pray together, and you'll see in these prayers and in a number of them, some words are in bold type. Those are the ones we join in with together. So if you can, wherever you are, why not join with me in those particular bits? So let's greet each other and remember the one for whom we've come today. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. We have indeed come to praise and to hear God's word, to pray and to seek forgiveness. We've come to receive so many good things from a generous God. But if we're going to unwrap those gifts of God properly, we will need his help. So let's talk to our Father now and ask this would be a special time touched with the presence of his Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, if you've been with us over these last few weeks, you'll know we've been hearing again the story of Esther, a brave young woman in very dangerous times with a particularly nasty enemy. Last week, you may remember, was another cliffhanger. Esther has this plan to save her people, one minute it's going really well, the next minute her enemy Haman is planning to murder her own cousin Mordecai. And so we're left wondering, will Haman win? Will Esther find a way out? Or will Haman find himself on the end of a nasty pole? Uh, and you might just be wondering, what's all this got to do with us in 2020? Well, later on, we'll get the answers from the Bible reading as Eldon brings that to us and as Jim opens it up. But before all that, kids, we have something really special for you. Let's go to Ruth. That's upside down. Hello and welcome to the second installation of Baking with Ruth. Now today we are going to make a peach cake. Let's see how it'll turn out. So I've got all my ingredients out, but I need to work out what's what. So I'll take my bowl, it's upside down, which doesn't seem to be very helpful, but we'll start. And next we've got some, some, Coarsed, coarsed, um, oh, it's the wrong way around. I have some stalk, so I'm going to start with some butter. So I've added my butter into the bowl next to some sugar. Oh, better not open it up this way around. We'll add the eggs before we add the flour and the baking powder. 
So next I'm going to add the the roll RS roll. Oh no, it's upside down again. Self-raising flour. So we're adding the same amount of self-raising flour as we are of eggs, butter and sugar. So they're always the same. That's a little baking tip for you. Not making the same mistakes I just did. That's some baking powder. Also, I'm adding 180 grams of everything because my three eggs weighed 180 grams. A few drops of alavni, alavni. Oh, vanilla, vanilla. A few drops of vanilla. And we're good to go. Next, I'm adding the peaches into the cake. So now I'm adding my mixture into the bowl. And now the oven is going into the cake for 25 minutes. Wait, the oven's not going into the cake, the cake's going into the oven. Sorry, I got that upside down, didn't I? You see, now there have been many disasters in this cake making process. And to be honest, it looks quite boring, but... If I take this off... You can see, it's an upside down cake. Now my baking went completely upside down, didn't it? It even ended in an upside down cake. But I suppose even though it did go wrong a few times, it had a very positive ending. Now, let's listen out in the sermon to see if we can hear about a series of events that get turned completely upside down. And once again, maybe it's not a bad thing. So, we're going to be thinking about Esther and what God is up to in our lives a little later in the service. But if there's anything we've seen of God in this book of Esther, it's that he's the one who holds our lives in his hands. Often the powerful and the wealthy, sometimes we ourselves think that we're the ones pulling the strings. We have our lives, we write the story of our lives. But God is so much greater. And that's the theme of our opening song today. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Let's join our music group as we sing this wonderful song.
Isn't that a powerful song and yet a surprising song? The one who holds the oceans in his hands became human. That those hands that had held creation became human and were nailed to a cross, bearing our guilt out of love for us so we could come home as his friends. The problem is, even once we've turned to Christ, we still mess up, don't we? We need forgiveness not just the once, but throughout our lives. Just as our bodies need a regular wash, so do our hearts. And that is exactly what Jesus gives us. So today, at this point in the service, let's once more turn afresh to our Heavenly Father. If we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wrongdoing. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is great news, isn't it? To have a new start, to find mercy instead of blame, to find open arms instead of a closed door, to be children of God and not his enemies. And that's actually the lovely thought of our next song. It's a kid's song which just revels in the fact that we are God's children and his awesome love for us. Now, can I just encourage you, please use this song as you find helpful. It's a kid's song and there are some great actions for it. And many of us love to join in, but not all of us. So can I encourage you just to take part as you find helpful. If you enjoy actions, then go for it. And if it's not you, well, why not just watch and enjoy the others making a fool of themselves or enjoying the Lord's presence, we can put it that way. Anyway, let's join our group as we sing, Don't It Blow Your Mind. blow your mind to see the awesome kind of love our Father has got. Don't it rock your world to know you can be called a child of a powerful God. Don't it blow your mind to see the awesome kind of love our Father has got. Don't it rock your world to know you can be called a child of a powerful that is what you are when you trust in Jesus. That is what you are when you faith in Him. Don't it blow your mind to see the awesome kind of love our Father has got. Don't it blow your mind? 
Don't it rock your world to know that you can be called a child of a powerful God? It's a great truth, isn't it, that we are children of a heavenly Father. The only difficulty is that sometimes life doesn't feel that way, not for Esther and not for us. Um, Haman, when we last saw Esther, Haman, her bitter enemy, was about to get rid of her cousin. We have no idea, as she had no idea, quite how was it going to work out. And what good is it then to be the child of a powerful God? Well, we're going to find out now as we listen to our Bible reading and as, then as Jim unfolds it for us. But before we hear the reading or the sermon, why don't we pray and ask that the Lord would really speak to us today. Father, we thank you for your awesome love for us. Thank you that you are indeed a powerful God. As we listen to the Bible now and as Jim unfolds it for us, help us to hear your voice. Help us to see a bit more of what it means to be children of a powerful God. Amen. Today's Bible reading is Esther, chapter 6, verse 1, through to verse 10, chapter 7. That night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh. Two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? the king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him what should be done for the man the king delights to honour. Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. <clears throat> then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. <clears throat> let them robe the man the king delights to honour, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Harman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Harman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterwards, Mordecai retired to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his and wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall started is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried arm and away to the banquet Esther was preparing. So the king and Harman went to dine with Queen Esther, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? 
even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then the queen answered, If I have found favour with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had been merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King, Zer king Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Harmon was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the palace? As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Harmon's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows, 75 feet high, stands by Harmon's house. He has made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Harman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, we're going to be looking together this morning at Esther chapter 6 and 7. But before we do that, shall I pray that God would help us? Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us stories like this incredible story here. I pray that by your grace you would allow us to be shaped by the story that tells us the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's great to be preaching to you again. The great difference between last time and this time is that I have now actually met a few of you and look forward to meeting more. One of the things I've done as I've met people is I've asked them a little bit about their story. And although they are individual and many and varied, I have noticed a couple of patterns. A great many of you can tell a Christian soldier story. You've been serving the Lord a long time and you look back over that and you see that as a story. There's another story I've noticed and you might call that a connoisseur story. You've been a Christian a while. You have served in different churches over different periods of time and you have now a clear idea of what faithful ministry and a good church will look like. Well, one of the things that I have reflected on is that stories are more than just a report of our experience. Stories actually shape us. Let me give you some examples. Almost every nation or culture has a shaping story. Think about the American dream. It's an opportunity story. It tells you that you can be anything you want to be, provided you believe and work hard. I think football clubs have stories too. I've already admitted I'm no football expert, but I know enough to know that some clubs have loyalty stories, some clubs have underdog stories, some clubs have pride stories. And it's not just nations and football clubs. I think individuals live out a narrative too. Sonia and I have two dear friends, let's call them Eeyore and Tigger. They are married, so they live basically the same life. But the story that runs in his head tells him that everything that could possibly go wrong will go wrong. And the story that runs in her head tells her that everything has a fun side and probably it'll all be all right in the end. You can imagine that their experience of life, their choices and how they feel about past, present and future could not be more different. You see, stories give us an identity, 
they tell us something about what we should be doing and they tell us a great deal about how things will turn out in the end. What that means is that a better story should lead to a better life. And the best kind of story is a true story. So our challenge this morning is to work out from Esther chapter 6 and 7 what God's story is and allow that story to shape us. Well, the first thing we notice from looking at the story is that God writes reversal stories. Consider the two main characters in this morning's story. They are Mordecai and Haman. Mordecai has been a great sufferer all his life. He's an exile. He was trafficked from his home city of Jerusalem. He's old enough, in fact, to remember the terrible day when the huge Persian army marched into the city. They were too clever just to kill and destroy. Instead, they humiliated and weakened Jerusalem by carrying away the skilled, the educated and the young and healthy to the Persian capital of Susa to work for the enemy. Mordecai was educated and so he was taken. His baby cousin Esther was young and healthy and so she was taken. In fact, Mordecai discovered Esther, an unaccompanied minor in the city of Susa. Her parents either lost or killed and he took her in and he raised her as his own. But even Esther has been taken from him into the palace for the sexual gratification of the king. And if you can believe it, things have recently become even worse for him because the most senior politician in Susa is a supremacist and he hates the Jews and he's passed genocidal legislation that calls for the annihilation of every Jew, man, woman or child in the empire. This is horrific, something to rival the 20th century Holocaust. Even the people of Susa are outraged. There is of course nothing that Mordecai can do so he goes on hunger strike outside the palace gates and even this protest brings more trouble on him because on the morning that we meet Mordecai the politician has been so irritated by his protest that he plans to have him executed. That is how we meet Mordecai this morning. What about Haman? Well, Haman, the main thing you need to know about him is that he is that supremacist politician. His life could not be more different from Mordecai's. Whereas Mordecai is an alien and stranger in Susa, Haman is quite at home here and he's a big name with his family and his friends around him. And whereas Mordecai is absolutely powerless, Haman is full of influence. He has the money to bribe people and he's able to push through life-changing legislation apparently without any challenge. And on the morning that we meet Haman, he's about as pleased with himself as he's ever been because he's just been invited along with the king to a banquet with the queen. Well, that's how we meet them on the morning of our story. Who would have guessed that by the evening of the same day, it would be Mordecai who was wearing the king's robes and it would be Haman who was hanging from the very gallows that he had built for Mordecai. I don't know such a reversal story anywhere in literature. And there is something else I'd love you to notice and that is that it is the wrongs in the story that actually produce the rights. Notice it was Haman who constructed, designed the honours that were given to Mordecai. Why was that? Well, it's because in his arrogance, Haman assumed they must be for him. And it was Haman who had to lead Mordecai's procession. Why was that? It's because he'd just walked in the court to ask for her, Mordecai's execution order. And it was Esther who was in the right place at the right time to influence the king, change his mind and expose Mordecai. Why was that? It was because in her vulnerability, Esther had been exploited and taken into the palace. God writes reversal stories. And as one children's Bible puts it, in those stories, all the bad things come untrue. 
This must have been an absolute favourite in the years after Esther because the poor Jews, many of them remained in exile and those that did return home suffered centuries of military occupation that were still going on when Jesus was born. They would have loved a story that says, one day God will come through, the oppressor will be put down and the Jewish people will be saved. But I wonder if that's the right interpretation. Is this really a geopolitical reversal? If it was, why on earth would God's promises to the Jews always talk about them being a blessing to the nations around them? Furthermore, why would it be that when Jesus came, he was concerned to teach and heal and bless Gentiles as well as Jews? Other people see this as an economic reversal, a kind of Robin Hood story. But if God's story is about making the rich poor and the poor rich, why would Jesus have said, the poor you will always have with you? And why would his circle of closest friends include both rich and poor? Other people see it as a fairness story. But if this is about the people who do right getting a good ending and the people who do wrong getting a bad ending, why on earth are the characters painted in their full complexity, obviously not perfect, obviously getting things wrong? And why would Jesus say that he came for the sick and for sinners and not for those who were healthy and perfect? Well, the ingredients to interpreting this story, to understanding the reversal, are right here in the story of Haman and Mordecai. Can you imagine a character anywhere in literature who is more obviously proud than Haman is? And can you imagine a story anywhere in literature where pride is obviously the cause of his fall? And can you imagine a character more obviously humbled and powerless than Mordecai? And can you imagine a story where his redemption is more obviously nothing to do with him, quite out of his hands? You see, this is not a geopolitical reversal or a wealth reversal. This is an identity reversal. To put it in the words of Proverbs, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Those who thought much of themselves have been made little of, and those who thought little of themselves before God have been made much of. Many of God's Old Testament people did understand that the story was one of identity reversal, and they lived humbly before God. Listen to what the book of Hebrews has to say about them. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not their home. They were looking for a city not their own. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. They died waiting. We have the enormous privilege of living on the other side of the great identity reversal of history. Because the cross of Jesus Christ changes everyone's identity. Think about it. The royal son of God, who was with his father from the beginning, made the earth and sustains every life, gave his life as a ransom. He was called cursed. He took our identity. And as a direct result of what he did, the meanest, most offensive, most ordinary man, woman or child can at a word be called an heir and son or daughter of God. I can't imagine a bigger reversal than that. And furthermore, it's a reversal that sifts every single human heart. Because the one qualification for being called a child of God is to recognise our deep need before him. And the one thing that can exclude somebody from that great reversal is to already think that we are something and don't need God's grace. You see, God has always opposed the proud 
and given grace to the humble, but it's at the cross that that reversal actually takes place. So stories shape us, and a better story will mean a better life. But what for those people who want to be shaped by God's story? Well, maybe you're somebody who's understood or heard God's story for the very first time. What should you do? Well, first of all, I'd encourage you to have a really good hard look at the story that is currently shaping you. Who does it tell you you are? What does it tell you you should be doing with your life? And how does it tell you things will turn out? Compare that with God's identity reversal story that tells you that you are incomplete and in need before God. It gives a purpose to your life and it gives you hope for how things will turn out. Please don't misunderstand the story. It doesn't expect you to earn or bring anything to the table. The story that you are considering to accept or to reject is nothing more or less than a complete reversal of identity. Maybe you're somebody who's been living by that story for some time. For you, it's an old, old story. I think what I recognise, at least for me, is how easy it is to replace that story with something much less good. You see, in God's story, we are people who are in great need, who have been given an enormous gift. We have absolutely nothing to be proud of in God's story. If I recognise symptoms to suggest that I think I have got something to be proud of, I need to seriously re-examine whether I'm still living out of the identity that God gave me. Let me give a couple of examples that have happened to me even in the last 24 hours. How do I feel when somebody fails to recognise my contribution? Am I a little offended? How do I feel when somebody criticises what I've done? Am I a little defensive? If I am, I need to have another careful look at the story that is shaping me. And those people I've been meeting with, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian soldier or becoming a connoisseur. Both service and discernment are great things, but if they become our story, we will not look like the humble people that we should look like before God. What story is shaping you? Thank you so much, Jim. Well, an amazing God who turns our ideas upside down. We so often think that God is like us, whereas so often he is utterly different. And he's constantly surprising us, just as he did for Esther and Haman, and just as he did with Jesus on the cross. The cross looked foolish and weak, but actually it was immensely wise and immensely strong. In fact, it was God's victory. Well, we're going to think a bit more about God's surprising power and victory now as we join in words of faith with Christians across the world. Why not join with me wherever you are as we say these words of an affirmation of faith? Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's good, isn't it, to share words of faith with other Christians. But of course, what God has done for us and just all that Jesus means for us and our world is much too good just to keep to those who already believe. A little while ago, a friend of mine found a great new car dealer where he bought a new car. He got such a great bargain, we couldn't stop him talking about it. Well, you know, as Christians, we have something so much better to share than a cheap bargain. 
and yet sometimes we can be a bit tongue-tied and not know what to say. Well, that is why just a couple of Saturdays from today at St John's we're having a special online conference called Let's Get Started in Bible Sharing. And we're really privileged and excited to have a guest speaker coming all the way from Scotland, Mark Campbell, who's coming to share with us. Well, a few days ago, I met up with Mark via Zoom and asked him to tell us a bit about himself and the conference. So let's see what Mark had to say. Well, Mark, uh, a warm welcome to Sheffield. We are really looking forward to meeting you properly in September, or at least virtually in September. Uh, but can I be nosy just for a minute? Tell us a bit about yourself, where you live, your family, that sort of thing. Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Rick. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, yeah, I'm from, I'm from Glasgow, so I, I do hope you can understand me. And I'm, I'm married to Karen, um, and we have two, two fairly lively boys. Um, uh, and an even livelier dog. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm based at the moment. That's my family set up. Um, and I think I'm right in saying you used to be a teacher. Yeah, secondary. Um, I've been a, a teacher in secondary school for uh, 16 years. Um, and yeah, so that, that was my background. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark, you're now working for something called the Word One to One. Tell us what that's about. Well, the, the word one-to-one -one is, is it's really just a, a resource for Christians to use with people that are, that are not Christians. It's just the Gospel of John, uh, but it's just been broken down into sort of small booklets, um, short, we call them episodes, so short episodes. Um, and it's been written in a way that's just accessible to someone that's not familiar with, uh, with the Bible. Um, it's informal, so it's just about meeting one-to-one -one and having a coffee and, and having a chat over, over the gospel. Uh, it's conversational, it's relational, it's that sort of thing. Um, what's your own experience of the word one-to-one -one being, Mark? Um, I think the first thing I would say to, to you um, and to those listening is that um, I don't think I'm very good at it. Uh, and I'm not being falsely modest. I'm just, that's, that's something that I, I don't feel I'm a natural evangelist in that sense. Uh, so the first person that, that I started to read with was my brother. Um, now, my brother, uh, he hadn't been in church for about 20 years. I mean, it's a long, long time for he'd been in uh, that he's been in church. Uh, the conversation of church or Jesus was very much off the, off the table. Um, so I did say to him about, you know, as I say, about almost two years now, uh, I said to him, I said, I know you don't believe this, uh, but have you ever read the Bible intellectually just to see what you think? Uh, and if you'd like to, we could sit down and have a look. Uh, and he said he would. And, and so we started meeting together. Uh, fantastic. We met, we met at a pub mainly, um, as we read, just that was where he was comfortable with and, and we just chatted through. Uh, but yeah, really, really good. Um, and then the, the next person I started to read with was, um, in fact, my brother actually said to me about three or four sessions into it, he said, are you doing this with anyone else? And, and, and I said, no. And he said, you should, it's really good, it's great. Um, so that wee bit of encouragement, um, I was out for dinner with a colleague from school uh, and he asked about church uh, and, and, and I guess like most of us I was sort of stumped to know what to say kind of on the spot and I'd worked with him for five years and never asked about church once you know. Um, anyway I said, I said it's good, I said, actually it's really good, I've been, I've been reading the Bible with my brother and he's not a Christian, we've just been looking at what it says and, and, and kind of discussing that. Uh, and then he said to me, he said, oh, could I do that with you? Um, and it was just, just amazing, just, just the openness to kind of talk about it. He asked me, we started to read together and so on. Um, and what I've found over the last, um, yeah, coming up for two years now, but over, over that time is that I've been able to ask more and more people, so people that are, maybe I just know through the community or colleagues or family members. Um, uh, and, you know, there's been a lot of people that have said no, uh, but there's been far more people that have said yes. Now, obviously, on the 12th of September, you're coming to lead, or you will via Zoom be leading, getting started in Bible sharing, this conference for a morning. Um, we're really grateful you're going to come and help us. Um, who would you reckon could benefit from being at that, Mark? Resources aimed really for, for any Christian. So it doesn't matter in terms of age or experience, but really for any Christian. If you follow Jesus, if, you, if you're somebody that would... We just love to, to be more equipped, maybe just feel more able to, to introduce your friends, your family members uh, to Jesus. That, that's what it's for. 
Can I ask what would you say would you, your hopes for the conference be, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I think what, what I'm trying to, do, what I would hopefully do at this the conference is, is just kind of just introduce why share the Bible. You know, for some people that might be, wow, that's a bit, that's a bit far. How, how, how do you do that? You know, what, you know, is that not a bit much? So, so I just want to kind of chat briefly about how, how we, why we do that and then how we do it. So just kind of looking at actually how do we use the notes and, and that sort of thing. Mark, well, some folks might be interested, but thinking, wow, 9.30 to 12.30, three hours on Zoom. Um, that sounds a bit much to me. Oh, yeah, I, I think um, I suppose a couple of things in terms of um, hopefully my teaching background and just my experience of using, uh, you know, being involved in other churches, I, I hopefully will set it at the right sort of pace. Uh, it will be broken up. It will be varied. There'll be plenty uh, breaks and, and so on within that. I hope it will be helpful. I hope it will be realistic, not not something that's beyond uh, beyond those that are coming. Um, and and I suppose another way of looking at it is it's such an important thing to think about. Uh, and maybe actually maybe three hours on a Saturday is is not that much of a cost in some ways uh, to, to give some time to think about it. Mark, thank you. And I I will add that there will be regular coffee breaks, although folks have to bring their own. <laughs> Great. Mark, can I just say thank you so much for your time today uh, and how much we really look forward to seeing you uh, in September. So thank you. Great, thank you. Likewise, likewise. Well, I hope you can see we have a real treat coming up. The only thing is, friends, we do need your booking now. Uh, we have some goodies we want to send you to get you ready for the conference, and that means we do need bookings for the conference by this Friday, the 4th of September. All you need to do is get in touch with Fee Batty, our parish administrator, and let her know. There is a modest charge, it's £4, but that will more than cover the time, and I assure you it'll be money well used and time well used. I do hope you can join us. Well, we've had some time listening to God today, but we've now come to that point in our worship where we want to talk to him because he's a, a good father who longs to give his children good things. And we're going to hand over now to Ian, who will lead us in our prayers. Please respond to the following prayers. When I say the words, Lord, have mercy, could you please reply, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we thank you for the example of Esther, who waited upon you for an answer to hear her prayers. May we learn to follow her example and wait on you when we are tempted to answer things for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our troubled world and for a cure to the coronavirus, which is ravaging your earth. Lord, be with us in the times of suffering and be with those suffering from the virus and also from war and poverty. And we especially think at this time of people in Yemen and Beirut and hold to you the people losing their homes in Californian fires. Lord, we pray for the people of New Zealand who are responding to the trial of Brunton Tarrant. May they find peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, bless our young people as they return to school. And we especially pray for the primary schools in Chapel Town and High Green, and for Ecclesfield School and Chapel Town Academy. Be a wise guide to our communities, Lord, at this time, in how they react with each other in work and socially. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for your church and ask your wisdom on plans to return to worshipping together at St Saviour's and St John's. Bless our bishops and our church leaders. And we especially ask your blessing 
on Carl as he leaves to train to be a clergy person. And we ask your blessing on Michael as he arrives to take up his post here at St John's as youth leader. Show them wisdom and guide them in their new ministries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we ask your wisdom for our Queen and Parliament in dealing with issues in this country of politics and economics. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray in a moment's silence for those we know who are suffering at this time in body, mind or spirit. Touch and heal all those whose lives are scarred by sin and pain, that raised from death to life in Christ, their sorrow may be turned to eternal joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remembering in your mercy those gone before us who have been well-pleasing to you from eternity. Preserve us who live here in your faith, Guide us to your kingdom and grant us your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And the collect for the twelfth Sunday after Trinity. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness, increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so gathering the prayers together, we say the family prayer that Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you, Ian. Friends, our time is almost over, but we did want to finish with a great hymn of praise. And our closing hymn just reminds us, however much we think we write the story of our lives, just as perhaps Haman did uh, and Esther knew better, actually our lives are being written by a much greater author, God of the ages, history's maker. And that is what we're going to sing about now as Catherine leads us in this closing hymn.
Well, a big thank you to our music group for today's music. There have been too many, I think, for me quite to remember who was involved, but really grateful to every one of our musicians and vocalists for today. And can I say thank you for joining us? We really hope you've enjoyed your time with us and will join us again the same time, same place uh, next week. And can I also say, if at any point in the service today anything's been said or you've seen that has raised questions for you, we would just love to hear from you. You can do that either by sending us an email or if you go to the coronavirus page of the St John's website, scroll down, there's a form you can fill in and send us there and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Well, before our closing prayers, there are, I'm afraid, a few items of church family news to share with you. Well, I'm not afraid because they're really exciting and really quite important. Here's number one, return to worship. You may just have spotted some churches are starting to worship together again, and you may be wondering what's happening in Chapel Town, what's happening in High Green. Well, let me tell you. Let's start with St Saviour's. They are in fact going to be back in their building from next Sunday, the 6th of September. There will be limits as to how many they can fit in and there will be restrictions as to how they can worship. But if you're a St Saviour's regular, you should have received either a letter or an email about that. And can I just reassure you, if you're from High Green and you cannot go to St Saviour's for quite a while, there will still be something online here and you will be extremely welcome and one or two folks from St Saviour's will still be taking part. Let me say now a word for those of you from St John's, because those of us at St John's will be waiting just a little bit longer, I'm afraid. We have a really rather nice but thorny problem. We have more people who want to come than we can safely at the moment accommodate in our normal meeting place. And so we are trying to work out a fair and a safe way to sort that. And our sense is it's going to take us a few weeks to try and do this in the right way. So for that reason, we are going to be sticking with online worship at least till the end of September. Again, if you're a regular at St John's, you should have received an email or a letter about that. And can I also say there's actually a video message from me, a midweek message on the coronavirus page of our website, which simply explains why we're doing that and what we are doing. The big thing we want to say is, even if we cannot yet all be together at once, there are legally a number of ways groups can meet to perhaps share the online worship together. It says a bit about that on the video and in the letter you've received by email. So can I encourage you, why not think if there are ways you could perhaps connect with maybe just a few other people to enjoy our online worship. So just a few words about resuming worship. Secondly, a central prayer meeting. There are loads of new things beginning at this time of year, lots of opportunities and a few challenges that we face. Uh, we've got a new youth minister, for instance, starting this Tuesday. Michael is arriving. Lots of people are going back to work. Many of our young people are starting school. And we thought, what better way to start the new term than in prayer? But you may be a bit puzzled. How can you have a prayer meeting at these times? Well, the answer is a wonderful gift called Zoom. So on Tuesday, the 1st of September at 7.30, there is a Zoom central prayer meeting for folks from St John's. We do hope you can join us. Again, we have emailed or posted out the details for the Zoom meeting. And if for any reason you've not had them, please uh, c contact Fee, our parish administrator, and she will make sure you get them. Thirdly, a word about the food bank. As perhaps you can imagine, the High Green Food Bank is very much in demand at the moment, but also urgently needs some new volunteers, particularly on Fridays. Can I, can I appeal to you, if you have a car and can help collect food from Asda, they would love to hear from you. And if you can spare a bit of time on a Friday to package up stuff, maybe to hand out food to those who come, again, we'd love to hear from you. If you could give some time to the food bank on Fridays, again, please contact Fee at the parish office and we will put you in touch with the right people. Last, but by no means least, can I tell you we have a new sermon series coming.
Today is the last Sunday we're going to be in the book of Esther. Next week, we look forward to the start of a new sermon series called The King and His Bride, God's Passion for His People. We're going to be exploring through the whole Bible and through a very powerful picture in the Bible of God as the husband and human beings as his bride. And it'll help us to understand what does it really mean to say God loves you. We're really excited about this sermon series. And if you want to know a little bit more of what that's about, well, come along and listen. And we'd love to see you. Well, friends, whether or not we are able to meet physically at the moment, nothing on earth can stop us praying for each other, keeping on listening to God's word, supporting each other by text, by phone, by Zoom, by writing a letter or sending a card. And most of all, nothing stops us being blessed by God and receiving his grace. So we're going to finish with some lovely words of prayer, of blessing, and of grace. Please respond in the words in bold type. The Lord Almighty is our Father. He loves us and tenderly cares for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Saviour. He has redeemed us and will defend us to the end. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, is among us. He will lead us in God's holy way. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Friends, it has been so good to be with you today and we hope you've enjoyed your time. Please do join with us the same time, the same place next week. But for now, bye bye.